Hi, my name is Aaron, this is my show Reeducation, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, I've talked about this several times in the past, but I'm going to talk about it again today uh, because I feel like it's important to take a look at all of the old school, classic Marxist or communist ideas, break them down into their smallest components, and actually figure out what we can use, what we have to discard, what is good, and what is bad. So with all of that being said... Let's get into it. Okay, so the dictatorship of the proletariat. What exactly is that? What does it mean? Well, if you're to ask a Marxist-Leninist, traditionally the group of people that came up with the idea, uh, they'll tell you that a dictatorship of the proletariat is not a traditional dictatorship. A traditional dictatorship is basically someone at the top rules over a bunch of people that are at the bottom. And if you ask them, that's not exactly what this means. It's kind of the inverse of that. Basically, the idea boils down to there is a dictatorship that controls the capitalist class and tells them what they can and can't do with their property, land, and resources, and so on. And for the rest of the people, they have a regular democracy. Now, the more astute among you would probably ask, well, why exactly do we need to have a dictatorship uh, over the capitalist class? Uh, why couldn't we just make laws and stop them from doing what they do and eliminate private property and that sort of thing? Well, traditionally, a dictatorship of the proletariat is part of, like I was saying, Marxism-Leninism, which is basically Marxism specifically tuned for the conditions of Soviet Russia, or pre-Soviet Russia. And Lenin, at the time, believed that the only way that they could actually gain control was to have the workers rule over the capitalists as opposed to the capitalists ruling over the workers. And they would do that uh, through the extension of the state. Now, they couldn't just eliminate all of the private property and money that the capitalist class was using uh, to control and own all of the resources because Lenin believed that they needed a transitionary period between uh, full-on capitalism, or back in those days it was actually more of a feudal absolute monarchy, but they couldn't go from a monarchy directly to communism uh, without having some sort of advancement within their economic structure. Back in those days, Russia was a very poor, very agrarian country with a very, very low literacy rate. So Lenin believed that he needed to bring that country uh, to the top of the world, as it were, basically bring them into uh, the 21st century, sorry, bring them into the 20th century, uh, and give them things that they needed to actually survive and thrive, like functioning industry, industrial revolution-style businesses and firms started to become the norm, and that's what Lenin basically wanted to do. He wanted to make sure that the country uh, was, first and foremost, able to house, clothe, and feed all of the citizens. At least, ostensibly, that was the idea. But whatever, I'm getting a little bit off topic here. We'll get back to the whole transitionary period thing in a second. But first, we're going to talk about the three main reasons uh, why you would have a dictatorship of the proletariat in the first place. Reason number one is to break capitalist resistance and stop any attempt for them to regain control. Reason number two is to rally the working class around the proletariat and prepare them for the abolition of classes. Basically, uh, getting them ready to uh, fully have democracy and that sort of thing. And reason number three is to use the national army to arm the revolution to protect against any threats, uh, foreign or domestic usually capitalist threats uh, in the form of other capitalist countries that are trying to invade and destroy uh, the socialism that they've created, or from internal threats such as sleeper cells or moles or whatever it is from, again, other capitalist countries usually uh, that are trying to subvert the uh, socialist structure and uh, destroy it from the inside. Now, obviously, those are three things that are very important, and you want to make sure that you mitigate those three things as much as possible. You don't want the old class to gain back control. You want to continue to create a democratic system. And obviously, if the capitalists or the old order are able to regain control uh, and completely destroy any revolutionary goals that that group might have, you're not doing that. And of course, Lenin and Stalin and a lot of other people believed that the only way that you could actually gain control and hold on to it is through an authoritarian dictatorship, but again, not by one person, by many. But what exactly does that mean, by many? 
Does every single individual proletariat, every single worker, get to put their boot on the throat of every capitalist? Is that how that works? Well, in practice, no. You would have to have some sort of group that would work on behalf of the proletariat to do that. Going back to my last video about the Vanguard Party, those people, the ones that would be the head of the Vanguard Party, would essentially be the ones that were in control of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, it isn't to say that those people couldn't come into those positions of power fairly and democratically to a certain point, uh, but the problem therein is that these individuals gained power. And like we were saying before, when individuals hold power, they have a hard time giving up that power. So even though the dictatorship of the proletariat seems like a good idea, the oppressed finally become the oppressors, really, it doesn't work that way in real life. It couldn't. There would be no way, or else you would have rampant just murder and killing all over the place. Anybody who assumed that another person was a capitalist or counter-revolutionary they would just kill them. And depending on what sources you read about the Soviet Union, that's kind of what happened even in regards to the government itself. They determined that anybody that was going against their ideas was either counter-revolutionary, an anarchist, or a capitalist. And they killed them. Okay, so we talked about what the dictatorship of the proletariat is, uh, we talked about what it does, but we actually haven't really talked about why it's used, and that's going to bring us uh, back again to the whole transitionary period that I was talking about a moment ago. Now, a transitionary period isn't necessarily a bad idea, and in fact, if you're talking about a backwards uh, agrarian country with a very, very low literacy rate, a transitionary period makes a whole lot of sense because a lot of those people haven't really been introduced to anything other than toil their entire lives. That's why a lot of third worldists believe that the only way that a real revolution can happen is from the third world because they can actually use a transitionary period of socialism to go from their uh, barbaric capitalist uh, ruling class to a you know, proletariat ruling class, or uh, the leveling of all hierarchies, hopefully, if they are able to finally transition through that socialist um, transition period. Now, just because they used that sort of transitionary period in the past uh, doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with it in every single instance. Do I think that certain countries could have gone about it in a different way, maybe gone about it in a little bit of a better way? Well, yeah, but it's history, so we can't really change what's already happened. What we can do is learn from the past and try to adapt and change and learn from our mistakes and make better decisions in the future. And as far as a transitionary period in general goes, whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, again, it really depends on the context of what you're talking about. In certain countries, it might be super beneficial. In other countries, it might not. In certain places, a transitionary effect may have already occurred and nobody's really even realized it yet. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But this idea that anarchists are 100% against a transitionary period, full stop, uh, is not true. It's not really a thing. Some people might believe that, sure. It does make some sense in some situations, uh, but it's not really the way anarchists think. And I hear a lot of people coming up with that conclusion uh, because they just read a little bit of Lenin and they thought, oh, well, Lenin's awesome. He comes up with a lot of smart things. So obviously everything he says about every person he doesn't like is true. And that's just not how things work. <laughs> uh, Lenin didn't like anarchists. So he didn't talk about them in ways that were beneficial to the anarchist cause. He thought that they were the enemy. So for all the good things that Lenin wrote, he also wrote a lot of bad shit too. And a lot of things that were complete and utter falsehoods, specifically when it came to anarchists. If I'm going to be frank, he tried to poison the well in regards to anarchy because he didn't like the idea in my opinion, because it took away his ability to hold on to control and hold on to power. But I digress. Lenin, at the time, believed that the only way that they could achieve some sort of communist country was to go through some sort of transitionary period where they were able to increase their industry and increase food production and increase standard of living and reduce uh, the death rates and those sorts of things. So he thought that the only way to do that was to use certain 
aspects of the existing structure to achieve those things. You see, Lenin was a pretty smart guy, and he realized that a small number of capitalists have to be appeased even after the revolution. Sure, all of the big capitalists can be oppressed uh, by the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. They can be told what to do and how to do it with their lands and property. But the smaller capitalists, the petty bourgeoisie and smaller, the people that owned independent businesses and that sort of thing, they made up a large percentage of the population of Russia at the time. So it's not like Lenin could just immediately go in and start killing them all or telling them all that they have to give up their land. He would pretty quickly lose the popular support of a lot of people if he did that. So he realized pretty quickly at the time that some of the smaller capitalists or petty bourgeoisie have to be appeased while the larger capitalists, the owning class, have to be oppressed, for lack of a better word. And those socialists also believed that they needed to still use some sort of money, some sort of uh, currency or commodity form, so they could easily do trade, because uh, trade is complicated without money, especially back then. Now, the reason why I'm saying that the capitalists had to be oppressed by the uh, working class or by the bourgeoisie is because Lenin knew that even after a revolution, the people that were in control before still hold an immense amount of power. Even if you strip most of their abilities away, they still have money hidden in places far off in other countries. They still have connections all over the world. They still have the ability to manipulate and change the minds of some of the most powerful people on the planet. And since he couldn't just take away all of the land, all of the resources, and all of the money from everybody that owned land within all of Russia, he had to appease certain numbers of those people to a certain extent. That's why he had to institute the whole dictatorship of the proletariat thing where they had to oppress certain groups of people within that capitalist class. You can destroy the kulaks, but if you take out the local shopkeep, you're probably not going to look all that good to the rest of the population. So you have to play that delicate little balance of who gets to live and who gets to die. It's a very depressing, uh, very disgusting way to do things. Okay, so we talked about what it is, what it does, and how it's used. Now let's talk a little bit about some alternatives because obviously uh, the problems that arise from removing the capitalist class are still there, and they have to be addressed. And some of the things that Stalin and Lenin both said about uh, the capitalist class and the dictatorship of the proletariat and the usefulness of it does still somewhat ring true. Now we'll just circle back to those three points that I made at the beginning on why that dictatorship is necessary. First, it's to break the capitalist resistance and to stop any attempt for them to regain control. Two, it's to rally the working class around the proletariat and to prepare the people for the abolition of classes. And three, to use the national army to arm the revolution and protect against invaders, foreign and domestic. So looking at number one, what exactly is the resistance that we have to take? How can we stop those capitalists from regaining control? Well, instead of exiling them or killing them all, you can just take away the stick that they used to beat everybody with. You see, back in Lenin's time, he believed that the only way that you could actually move from the backwards agrarian country that they had to a full-on communist structure was by using a transitionary period where they slowly got rid of certain things, like state, like class, and like money. But... He didn't live a hundred years in the future like we do today. And we actually have gone through, all by ourselves, a lot of those transitionary periods already. Absolute state control is actually being withered away to a certain extent by globalization and the internet, but money, in and of itself, is basically non-existent as it is. A lot of people think that money is the hardest thing to get rid of, that it's the one thing that nobody really can understand how we can even exist without it, and yet we do every single day. When's the last time you pulled a $10 bill out of your wallet? When's the last time that you actually had a pocket full of change? I'm going to assume it's been a little while, at least a couple of weeks, if not months, and that's because we've actually abstracted money to the point of it being virtually non-existent. All it is is this little card that you swipe at a till whenever you go and get groceries. 
And that little card doesn't even necessarily equate the amount of money that you have within your bank account because a lot of people have overdraft or have credit and that sort of thing so they can actually spend more than they actually have. So that card isn't necessarily a card that dictates whether or not they have the uh, money that they need to buy a thing. It's a card that basically restricts them from being able to get anything that they might need when they need it. Money has been reduced to a few numbers on a screen that are so easily manipulated that the Federal Reserve was able to inject trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy, into, well, the pockets of the millionaires and billionaires, just in the last few months. And it barely made any significant dent on anything at all. You would assume that injecting more money into an economy would obviously create inflation. But since the United States dollar is the fiat currency, the dollar that everybody all over the world uses, it doesn't matter. They can throw as much money into it as they want, and as long as people all across the world believe that the dollar is worth something, then it is. It's all fiction. It's basically make-believe. The only thing that makes it real is the fact that people believe in it. It's exactly the same as Santa Claus. So we don't actually need to keep the thing. We can get rid of it entirely. Yes, I know, sweetheart. The reasons why we had it in the past was because it was easier to use a commodity form, some sort of currency, for us to do trading than it was for us to do it any other way. And now it's a lot easier for us to not even worry about actual money or gold or anything at all because it's easier for us to just hit a few keys on a keyboard and that'll automatically make the purchase that you need to make. You're so upset. Why are you so worried? Is it because uh, it's because I'm just talking randomly to a camera? So with money being basically abstracted into oblivion, we're already halfway there. Now all that's left is to just eliminate private property and wage labor and make it illegal, just like we made slavery illegal. I'm not saying that just making a few laws is going to change anything. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of. Uh, problems, uh, growing pains, if you will. And that can be resolved through step three, which I'll talk about in a second. But first, we'll talk about step two, the whole idea that we need to rally the working class around the proletariat um, and to prepare the people for the abolition of classes. Well, the abolition of classes basically means that everybody would have a say in what they do in their world, giving everybody democracy. So... How would we go about doing that? How would we make everybody able to have a say in what they do in their lives? Well, giving them workplace democracy and building those dual power structures is, is a great way to start. Worker cooperatives, free stores, community defense programs, these sorts of things are imperative when it comes to giving people the ability to feel as though they can actually make decisions and be autonomous in their own lives. Also, setting up in communities some sort of democratic confederalist style government would be absolutely beneficial and again would allow people to feel as though they have a part in their communities. And all of this can be done through forms of direct action. None of it has to be done through the current election electoral politics structure. If the people have the ability to make decisions on their own from the ground up, if they are all able to have equal say and democracy, it's almost impossible that they'd ever give that up. They'll love it. It'll be fantastic, unbelievable, but they'll still have that problem with the outside influence, uh, those capitalist class motherfuckers still having a lot of power uh, and a lot of abilities outside of the country itself. Even though you might be able to remove the stick that they beat everybody over the head with within the country, they're still going to have friends and allies and all sorts of resources in other countries, and that is a serious problem. But for that we would basically use the same sort of system as the dictatorship of the proletariat would use. The military. The only difference is that we would reorganize the military so it would be from the ground up rather than the top down. If you ask any GI or any veteran all across the entire country whether or not they've ever had a superior officer that was less than competent, I would say 99.9% .9 of those people would say, Yes, and they would be very welcome to the idea of electing somebody into a position of authority within that military structure 
that would be less likely to get them killed. So that protects from all manner of uh, threats that are foreign, but what about the things that are domestic? Obviously, you're still going to have a large number of independent business owners uh, that make up the population. In fact, 99% of all businesses in the United States are small businesses. Now that seems like a lot, and we'll really dive into those numbers on a future video, but really, it works out to about 0.5% of the entire population. Is that a lot? Well, yeah, it seems like it would be a lot, but about 76.2% of all of those firms, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. What can I say? She's a puppy. She's three months old and makes a lot of noise. Okay, so like I was saying, uh, about 76.2% of all of those firms are non-employers. So they don't even have anybody working for them. Usually it's only a business between one or two people and often it's somebody that isn't even getting paid to do that business. And about 90% of all of those businesses have fewer than 20 people actually working for them. So that only leaves about 1.5 million business owners with more than 20 employers all across the entire United States. Which really says a lot when you consider how many monopolies there are and the majority of the work that's being done is probably through Walmart or subsidiaries of Walmart or people that are working ancillary positions uh, around a Walmart. Again, we'll get into Walmart on another video, but for now we'll talk about this. So that means that even though the vast majority of businesses in the United States are small businesses, most of them are completely unpaid, and the majority of them are just people that are doing something to try to survive, working Uber or Lyft or that sort of thing. Most of those people aren't going to be super upset if you got rid of things like Walmart or big box stores, Target, Pizza Hut. Pepsi, I don't know, those sorts of places. So considering 99% of all businesses in the United States are all small businesses, and most of them are businesses that aren't even big enough to have more than 20 employees, well, if you consider that all of those businesses aren't really a threat, they're just basically individual people that are working to try to make a living, then you can consider that those would be a very essential part of the economy and something that in an anarchist society you would want to fund and endorse. No, you don't want these people to become capitalists and start hiring a bunch of employees. Obviously, you'd have to have rules and regulations uh, within those industries to stop that sort of thing. Obviously, wage labor would be akin to slavery. It should be already. But because the United States has worked so diligently to not only create monopolies, but oligopolies, monopolies that are made up of slightly more businesses than one, uh, it's created a really interesting situation where the majority of small business owners don't actually have employees and would benefit a great deal from changing things around and making sure that those businesses get the necessary resources that they need. It's the majority of the economy. So contrary to what we had in the Soviet Union, working with these smaller independent businesses in the way that I was talking about a moment ago is much more beneficial than oppressing them and having a dictatorship over them. You just have to eliminate the stick that they would otherwise use to beat people over the head with. No more wage labor. No more money. No more private ownership of the means of production. And that's it. That's basically how we could use the ideas from this dictatorship of the proletariat idea from a hundred years ago and reconstruct it and refigure it uh, for our modern day society. So thank you very much for watching. My name is Aaron. If you do get a chance, please check out all the links in the description box below. Hit that little bell button because they, you know that they're not going to tell you when I release a new video and make sure you're subscribed because they're unsubscribing people every single day. Thank you very much for watching. Have a nice day.